Hello, class. Uh, here, uh, why don't I switch to the other camera? I, I, I believe now that I have, I've tested it out several times, and I certainly believe now uh, that I have fixed the focus problem uh, with the camera. That's on my monitor. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to get back to it. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about uh, permittivity and uh, breakdown strength as compared to um, relative permittivity of materials. And so that's really what we've got in front of us today. We'll be looking at different uh, permeabilities for different types of materials, and we'll also be looking at uh, different breakdown strengths uh, for a variety of different materials. And we'll also talk about what is the mechanism, right? What is the mechanism for the phenomena of electrical breakdown? And uh, where to start? Because, yeah, this is like my third lecture, and it's only like... <laughs> So, uh, actually, my fourth, uh, because I did that one lecture twice. But, anyway, let's forget about that. Let's write down a couple equations here that we had. If you remember that first uh, force equation that we had, Q1 times Q2, as if only point charges could ever form an electric field, right? Over 4 pi epsilon r squared. And then we also realize that for an electric field, uh, just for a, a point particle, or an electric field in general, right? For, for about four, uh, well, let's say for, it would just be Q, whatever that particle is, whether it's an electron or a proton or, or whatever, divided by four pi epsilon r squared. And then, uh, however we found out what an electric field was, we could say that the force, you know, due to that electric field is just going to be the electric field times the other candidate charge that's moving through that electric field, right? I'll just say that it's the charge on an electron. If I use an electron, electrons moving through, just like we did with the electron gun, an electron is moving through the uh, electric field, um, of the electron gun, how would it be influenced? And isn't that the case? Is it, you know, gravity is a force field for us because we have mass. We don't have charge. But for an electron that has charge, an electric field is the same as a gravity field is for us, right? So anyway, I wanted to, to write that down. That's basically uh, what we have. And uh, we also want to look at the, the permittivity, right? So the permittivity, absolute permittivity, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. And the absolute permeability, 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henrys per meter, right? So. Uh, both of, of those, and of course, let's never forget epsilon equals epsilon sub r times epsilon sub o, and mu sub r equal, or, or mu sub r times mu sub o equals mu. There, I saved myself. So uh, with all of that stuff, uh, we, we have so many things to look at, but epsilon keeps popping up all the time, doesn't it? And so uh, what I want to do is I want to look at sort of a little table here. I'm going to write the dielectric. Right? I'm going to write the dielectric. And then I also want to put in the uh, 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 permittivity. And I also want the breakdown strength. All right, so the dielectric, the permittivity of that, and the breakdown strength for that dielectric. And they're competing uh, characteristics. 
if you, if you have a high permittivity, the chances are you're not going to have a high breakdown strength. If you have a high breakdown strength, chances are you're not going to have a high permittivity. Wouldn't it be great if we could get a high permittivity uh, material that also has a super high breakdown strength? All right, now polystyrene. Polystyrene, polypro, you know, all of those are pretty much uh, the permittivity. I'm going to put epsilon there so that you know that we're talking about permittivity. The permittivity of polystyrene is 2.7. Uh, polyethanol, I'll just put polyethyl, anyway, is 2.4, right? Its breakdown strength uh, for both of those is 20 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. I'm not going to write times uh, 10 to the 6. I'll put times 10 to the 6th up there. But the rest of them I'm just going to write down uh, the, so I don't have to write down uh, times 10 to the 6th over and over and over again. Oil. Oh, this one also, 20 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. Sure, I can't stop myself. Uh, oil, and that's about any kind of oil is approximately 2.1. So I could make a capacitor out of oil, couldn't I? And then my breakdown strength is going to be 12 million volts per meter. How about glass? Glass, another good material to use as your dielectric in a uh, capacitor. And glass can be anywhere, depending upon the doping that we put into glass, anywhere from 4.5 all the way up to 10. And its uh, uh, breakdown strength can be anywhere from 25 to 40 million uh, times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. Yeah, I know, I'm just uh, gonna have to write it over and over again. There's glass. Bakelite, Bakelite is uh, plastic that is not bendable. It's very, uh, you know, it's the old type of plastic. It's a thermosetting plastic rather than a thermoplastic plastic. And Bakelite used to be used even to make lamps in the uh, 1920s and, and things like that when it first came out before we had a lot of plastic. Uh, its relative permittivity is five, and its strength is 20 times 10 to the six volts per meter. Pretty high, right? All of those are, are pretty high. Bakelite mica, mica also is uh, uh, about five, but then mica's breakdown strength, and this is why mica is used uh, for large electrolytic capacitors is 200 times 10 to the 6 volts per meter. Mica has a really high uh, breakdown strength. All right. Uh, barium uh, titanate or strontium titanate. We call it ceramic material. Strontium titanate. I'm just going to, I'll write it down here, titanate. And strontium titanate has a uh, permittivity of 7,500, a relative. I'm going to put relative permittivity because we know that all these relative permittivities still have to be multiplied by the absolute permittivity, don't they? And, you know, when we look at uh, barium strontium titanate, uh, as far as the uh, strength goes, I think it's just uh, three three times 10 to the six volts per meter. So not a very high breakdown strength, but a super high relative permittivity, right? So uh, we use that, that's gonna have a purpose. We use mica uh, and we uh, you know, use glass for capacitor dielectric. So I don't see any reason, I almost hate to not have a border around my box. I guess that's from uh, learning Japanese. You know, you always have to make sure your boxes are all out there. Anyway, so we're, we're looking at this and I also wanted to look at 
what is the phenomena of uh, breakdown? You know, we're stretching atoms, aren't we? We're taking atoms depending upon which of these different materials you're looking at. And so when we put an electric field across those, these things all orient, just like on page 15 of the textbook that you're using. So all of a sudden we take a regular molecule, let's just say this is a regular molecule, and then we change that regular molecule because we're, we're electromagnetically stretching that molecule into a dipole, aren't we? So now we have a negative on one side and a positive on the other side. And how did we get that negative on one side and positive on the other side after we put an a, a electric field across this? So let's say that we've got an electric field here, and this is my positive side of the electric field, and here's my negative side of the electric field, and I'm placing an electric field in there, and now I'm getting a minus over here and a plus over here. Well, how have I actually stretched or, 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 or stressed that molecule or that atom that I've got here to create this dipole? where I've got the negative side over here and I've got the positive side over here. We would expect the electrons then to be on the negative side and we would expect the nucleus and stuff to have gone over here. So in this thing of an atom, I have the nucleus in the center, right? And then I have a bunch of electrons all around here, don't I? So I've got my nucleus. I'm drawing the nucleus larger, whereas actually the nucleus is, is smaller than the electrons. Uh, the nucleus is about one one hundredth smaller than any of the <laughs> electrons that are circling around it, right? Now, when I do this, what I've done is I've taken that positive um, nucleus and I've shifted it over to one side closer to the negative electrode of my um, electric field that I've applied there. And then on the positive side over here, I've got all of my electrons. Now, the electrons, of course, I'm saying are over here, but, but what are they really? They're still circling around the nucleus, aren't they? They just happen to be spending more time over here than they do on the other side of the nucleus. So if the nucleus was there, let's just look at uh, how it would be. Let's say the nucleus is there. And then, uh, you know, in the beginning, well, there, uh, uh, an electron would uh, just be going around uh, like that. Whereas once I start stretching this with an electric uh, or stressing this with an electric field, I'm going to have that over there. And then what I'm going to have as far as an electron goes is an electron is going to be going up here, staying over here, and then it comes down very fast and goes around, right? So most of the time, the electron is going to be over on this side, and then it very quickly comes back to this side, right? And then it has to get back over there. So does this one, has to get back over there. So what we do is we set up a polarity of the uh, um, atom or the molecule. Now, I'm gonna keep increasing the voltage on this. What eventually is going to happen? Eventually, I'm going to pull that nucleus far enough away that the influence the nucleus is having on the electrons is going to decouple. It's going to decouple. So, so eventually, what I'll have is the electrons decouple with the molecule and begin conducting. And that's what lightning is.
right? Eventually, I'm going to stretch this so far. I'm going to stretch this molecule or atom so far apart that the actual attraction then from the protons to the individual electrons will cease. The electrons will become free, right? And I'm not saying all of these electrons are just going to, the atom's going to break apart. No, the electrons, some of these electrons, so much, we're stretching it so much, are going to be so far away from the nucleus, they're going to start to pop up into the conduction band, conduction band, conduction band. And so once they start going there, what we see is we see, let's say that this is my capacitor. So as soon as we start liberating, we put so much voltage across here. We've stretched the molecule so much into a dipole. Let me write dipole here for your notes. We stretch it so much into a dipole that all of a sudden it becomes conducting along that line. We don't even know which line that is, but enough electrons will start to break free from the atom. They'll start to jump into the conduction band, and then all of a sudden they'll start conducting right? Some electrons will start, but immediately there's an avalanche effect so that there's a lightning bolt that goes through there. Now, once this happens with the capacitor, that's the end of the capacitor. Why do I say that? Because this lightning bolt that goes through there vaporizes the solid material. So the lightning And, and if that's any gas, it's not really a problem, like the atmosphere, because the gas just then reforms around it, doesn't it? But if it's in a solid and lightning occurs, that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens is I now have a uh, uh, air where there was dielectric. So now all of a sudden we vaporized the solid dielectric, right? Wherever this lightning has gone through, if we're using a solid dielectric, like most, most capacitors that you use. So we vaporize that solid dielectric. What's in place of that? Well, we've got a gas, don't we? That doesn't necessarily have to be air, but it is a gas. And, and what type of relative permittivity is that gas going to have then? Well, the relative permittivity of, of air is three, right? The breakdown strength of air is three. The permittivity of air is one. So I now have gone from a permittivity of 7,500 to a permittivity of one. In fact, it's not even a permittivity there. This is actually really created because when it goes through there, it melts other things. That it creates a conductive link from one side of the capacitor to the other, right? And so once we've got that conductive link in there, that capacitor is no good anymore. And this is how it goes. Now, can we do the same thing with magnetism? The answer is no, no, because we don't have individual monopoles that make up magnetism, do we? And that's what we're doing here. We're stretching the two different um, things. We don't have that with magnetism. That's not really how magnetism works anyway, but, but we're stretching this here. Finally, we break it and we send off these charge carriers by themselves. We cannot do that with magnetism. There is no independent charges. There's no independent North Pole. There's no independent South Pole. But there is an electricity, isn't there? There's electrons and there's protons. So we can do it with electricity. We cannot do it with um, magnetism. All right, and we've gone through uh, quite a bit of those, but I want to go through two other little areas here. I've mentioned this before about skin depth penetration. And I've said to you, uh, let's just get some fundamentals uh, about this, right? 
So wh what I said before was that uh, the permittivity inside an inductor is infinite. And so theoretically, no uh, electric fields that are coming up to a conductor, like gold, like uh, aluminum, like copper, anything that is coming up to those uh, conductors can't penetrate them. Uh, but that's not entirely true. You're probably wondering to yourself, do AC waveforms, do those travel inside wires or do those travel on the surface of wires? And how about DC? Now, that's one of the first things that I always teach in, in, in network theory. Uh, DC travels inside the wire. AC can travel inside the wire a little bit, but it's mainly a surface phenomena. AC is mainly a surface phenomena that rides on the outside of wires, whereas DC is an internal phenomena that's actually working on the inside of, of the wires. I wanna give you an equation. This is called the skin depth penetration equation, right? So the truth is that it always does uh, go into the conductor. How far into the conductor, uh, we'll, we'll figure out. So that's delta, and I usually put a small s underneath that. This is the skin depth penetration. So it's one divided by pi times the frequency times the, permea uh, the permeability of the conductor, not the relative permeability, the permeability of the conductor and the conductivity of the conductor, right? Now, when I say permeability of the conductor, uh, we can pretty much say that the permeability of any conductor that you see is going to be uh, equal to the permeability of free space, right? And so that means that the, the relative permeability of the conductor, the relative, is going to be one. All right, relative permeability of the conductor is one. All right, now, now how about the conductivity? What is conductivity? Well, conductivity is the reciprocal of resistivity, isn't it? And so we know resistivity for a whole variety of different materials, uh, and we can figure out what the conductivity is too. In fact, I, I'll do a couple for you right here. The resistivity of copper is 16 times 10 to the minus nine ohm meters. And in fact, you could say it's 16 times 10 to the minus nine ohm meters, or you could say that's 16 ohm nanometers, couldn't you? Right. And so if we wanted to find out the conductivity of copper, it'd just be one over 16 times 10 to the minus nine ohm meters. And that would give us 62.5 times 10 to the six mohs per meter. You're probably saying, isn't that really one over ohm meters? Yes, and one over an ohm is a mo. One over an ohm equals a Mo, and a mo is a unit of conductance rather than a unit of resistance like an ohm is, right? Okay, so that, that's one of them. The other one I, I wanna point out here too, if I took uh, aluminum, the resistivity of aluminum is 27 times 10 to the minus nine ohm meters. And that would give us a conductivity, which is one over resistivity, of 37 
It's 37.04, but I'm just going with 37 times 10 to the 6 mos per meter. All right. So there you go. I want to point out for both of these two that mu sub r equals 1, mu sub r equals 1 for both of those two. So if I was looking, let's just do a little example here. Mm. All right. So if I had a copper block and I was hitting it with some waveform, how far would it penetrate the copper block? You know, let's go to uh, a relatively uh, low frequency, right? How about something like a thousand hertz? F equals 1000 hertz. We know everything else about this. We know uh, the conductivity of that and everything else. So why don't we do that? So at a thousand hertz, the, the surface penetration is going to be one over pi times 1000 hertz times the uh, times four pi times 10 to the minus seven henrys per meter. You're probably saying, hey, that's the absolute, right? Well, absolutely it is the absolute. Right, and that's what I want to put in here because I'm going to put my relative permittivity in there too, right? That's right. So I put that in there, and then the last thing I need is my conductivity. Uh, I've got my permittivity now, or permeability. Uh, now I need my conductivity. And my conductivity, let's look at uh, copper. That's going to be 62.5 times 10 to the 6 mos per meter. I can use mos because they're a combination of primary units, aren't they? So my skin depth for copper uh, at 1,000 Well, actually, I haven't even figured, uh, I, I'm not sure if I figured that out for a thousand, although, you know, a lot of times I do. Anyway, let me get back to this. Let's, let's just see. So I've got pi times 1,000 times 4 pi minus 7 times 1 times 62.5 exponent six equals one over square root. I get 0 And you know, if I look at everything in there, they're all meters, aren't they? So that's gotta be meters. So that would be 3.6 millimeters. 3.6 millimeters, is that, seems wrong for some reason. Four pi, 10 to the seven, 62.5 times 10 to the sixth. Uh, Oh, no, that's right. Yeah, uh, because we're doing a thousand. <laughs> For some reason, I thought I was doing it with a million. <laughs> no, we're doing it at a thousand. And you can see that I'm penetrating into it about 3.6 millimeters. That's pretty good, isn't it? You know, if, if we wanted to change that instead of a thousand, we wanted to make that uh, F equals uh, one gigahertz then I think everyone would see this would go from 1,000, 1 times 10 to the 3 to 1 times 10 to the 9, and that would be 1 times 10 to the 6 difference. So that's a million difference, isn't it? And the square root of a million is 1,000. 
So uh, if I would at, at one gigahertz, the skin depth would actually be 3.6 microns. Does everyone see that? How is that? I didn't do it again. Anyway, all right. Uh, we're going to leave it there uh, for now. And uh, I'm pretty sure I'm around 30 minutes anyway. So, uh, and I'm going to start looking at the uh, next one that we have. Okay, we're moving along at a good rate now.